All right, so the last bit of material you're responsible for that's new for your final is, thing, is about things involving sulfur. The name we give to functional groups involving sulfur is thiol. Now, I'm going to start off by talking about, more specifically, thioesters. A thioester is very much similar to the regular ester we learned about in the carboxylic acid derivatives chapter, which had a carbonyl and then some OR group, where that OR group is O and then carbon. It could be OCH3, O-ethyl, O, any carbon. Thioesters are just, instead of OR, SR. Okay? Now, what I've given you here is a list of the carboxylic acid derivatives that are most likely to see on our exam. This list we've seen before, just without the thioester, and I'll talk about reactivities in a second, but let's just address what these are first. The acyl chloride is when you have a carbonyl with a Cl on it. And hydrides are where you have two carbonyls that share an alpha oxygen. Thioesters, now that we've learned them, is a carbonyl that has an SR group. And again, that R group is any carbon chain, whether it's a single carbon or 20. And regular esters are carbonyls with an OR group. Again, that R group can be any number of car any carbon chain in length. Finally, we have the amide, which is the carbonyl that has a nitrogen on it. And then R2, and for amides, it's a little different from esters and, and thioesters. When I say R, this in this case, that R could be hydrogens, any number of hydrogens, or carbons. So it could be NH2, it could be NHCH3. It could, be Na, it could be NCH3, CH3. So there are a bunch of different amides you could have, but in general, this is going to be, for amides, it's any number of hydrogens or carbons, and for the esters, it's, any, it's only carbons, not hydrogens, okay? So now let's talk about how reactive these derivatives are relative to each other. Now, if you've noticed, we've kind of made it seem that acyl chlorides are the most reactive, and that's for good reason. These guys are super duper reactive because how do they react? Well, we've seen it a thousand times now how these carboxylic acid derivatives react in general. You have some kind of nucleophile, let's say SCH3 minus now, since we're talking about esters, uh, five esters. That SCH3 minus comes in and attacks the carbonyl, that resonates up, and you get your intermediate, where it's single bond O minus, the chlorine leaving group, and the SCH3. Okay? And then what happens? Well, this should come as no surprise. The O minus swings down, and your best leaving group gets kicked out. In this case, the chlorine. And that's how all these acyl halide reactions work. But here's an example of using an acyl halide in a manner to make a thioester. Okay? So this is one of our main methods of making thioesters. But the point I want to take away from now is just the fact that the way these all react is something attacks the carbonyl, it swings up, swings back down, and kicks out a leaving group. So when we're talking about reactivities of these functional groups, we're going to look at it in terms of how good are they at kicking out that leaving group. How willing is that leaving group to uh, how willing is that leaving group to pop off? So let's look at the individual leaving groups first. Acyl chloride would pop off a Cl minus. Now we've learned that halogens are super electronegative, and to have that negative charge. It's pretty stable, just alone by the way electronegativities, but also because when that it's negative, it has a full octet, we have a very, very stable leaving group. The next most stable we'll find is in the anhydrides leaving group, a carboxylate, meaning a carbonyl with an O minus on it. Why is this stable? Because the O minus is capable of resonating with the carbonyl that pops off along with it. So it's nice and stable. Comparing that to an S minus, or SR minus in this case for the thioester, and OR minus. Why is SR minus more stable than OR minus? Sulfur is in the next row down from oxygen on our periodic table. And what that tells us is that sulfur has a larger atomic radius. We know that as we go down the periodic table, we increase in atomic radius size. And because you have a larger atomic radius in sulfur, you have more room for that negative charge's electrons to float around. And so they're more stable as a result. That's why SR minus is a better leaving group than OR minus. But it's not as good as O minus with resonance. Resonance has a better effect than just having a larger atom atomic radius, which is why the anhydride, the anhydride leaving group is still more stable than the SR minus. And then finally, we have and R2 minus. And if we're comparing things based on electronegativities again, well, oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, which means it likes to hold the negative charge better. 
And so an O minus is much more stable than an N minus, who's less electronegative. Okay? So now, what is our trend that we can write for all of this? Let's start by looking at the carboxylic acid derivatives. The trend is, as we go up to the acyl chloride, we are increasing reactivity. Okay? And conversely, as we go down, we're decreasing reactivity or increasing stability, meaning an amide is more stable than an acyl chloride, which makes sense. If you're more reactive, you're not going to be staying the same for long. You're going to react, and so you're not stable. So, there's my marker. So, basically, we could also say that inversely proportional to this, going down, increasing stability. Okay? Now, this, these two arrows are referring to the carboxylic acid derivatives. So, I'm talking about this, the carboxylic acid derivatives on these arrows. But now let's look at the leaving groups and see how they compare. So, as we said before, in the case of the carboxylic acid derivatives leaving groups, as we move up, we're going to be more stable, increasing leaving group stability. Which makes sense, again, like we said, the more reactive the molecule is, the better the leaving group. And the better the leaving group, the more stable it is when it comes off and becomes negative. So increasing leaving group stability. And conversely, as we go down, that would mean increasing instability or increasing reactivity of the leaving group. You're not going to want to kick out a leaving group that becomes super reactive, which is why an amide is so stable. It doesn't want to release NR2 minus, because NR2 minus is super, super reactive. It's not stable. So increasing reactivity of leaving group. Okay, so now how can we use this chart and apply it to questions? Well, there are two, kind of, there are two kinds of questions I can think of that they could ask that you can use this chart to help solve. General reactions, general reaction questions like, will this give you this final product? or questions about equilibrium. And I want to talk about equilibrium first, and then we'll go into individual reactions. So let's erase this chart and take a look at an example of an equilibrium question. So I'm going to draw you two separate reactions. I'm going to draw for you an acyl chloride plus SCH3 minus. We already saw what this will do when I gave you that example of the reaction. The SCH3 minus attacks the carbonyl, it swings up, swings back down, and kicks the chlorine out. And so what we got was the thioester as a product, SCH3, and we kicked out the Cl minus. Okay? Now a question they could ask is, here is a reaction scheme, and we want to know on the left or right side of these equilibrium arrows, where does equilibrium lie? And the way you go about solving these problems is simple. You look on both sides of the arrows and you say, okay, where are my most stable things or my least reactive things? So let's approach it from two different points of view. Let's look at the leaving group and then let's compare it and then we'll compare the carboxylic acid derivatives. So here we have an SCH3 minus and we're comparing it to a Cl minus. Which did we say was more stable in that chart of ours? Cl minus was the more stable leaving group. So right now, we know that right here, this is the more stable leaving group. Now let's look for the more stable carboxylic acid derivative. We have acyl chloride, which we said was the most reactive carboxylic acid derivative of them all, compared to a thioester, which we said was less reactive, which means this is the more stable carboxylic acid derivative. So equilibrium will always favor the side where the more stable carboxylic acid derivative and more stable carboxylic acid derivative leaving group are located, which in this case is this and that. And they'll always be on the same side. The two most reactive pieces will be on one side, and on the other side will be the two most stable. So let's do another example. Let's give you a amide now, NH2. Or let's not do H2, let's do NCH3, NCH3, and again, we're going to react that with SCH3 minus. And we're going 
to compare that to the, again, the thioester plus N methyl methyl minus. Okay, so once again, we're going to look at the two sides of these arrows and ask, okay, where's the most stable carboxylic acid derivative and where's the most stable leaving group? So we saw before that amides are the least reactive of all the carboxylic acid derivatives. They are the most stable carboxylic acid derivatives. So this is the side that has the more stable uh, derivative. Now what about leaving groups? If we compared S minus to N minus, we saw that, N, that S minus was the, most, the more stable leaving group of the two. So that's where our leaving groups line up. And so once again, we see that equilibrium in this case will lie towards the left side because the two more stable pieces are there. And so this is a, how you approach any uh, equilibrium question regarding carboxylic acid derivatives. It doesn't have to be limited to thiols. You can do this for any of your derivatives. Okay? Now, the other type of question I was alluding to was which of these reactions will not work as intended. So let's give you a couple of examples of reactions involving Thioesters. Let's start with the one we already saw. The acyl chloride reacting with SCH3 minus. Well, this should come as no, as a, no surprise. The chlorine's going to get replaced by the SCH3. And so we should expect this to be exactly what we get, and it is. But let's try and reverse this now. Let's say I'm starting with the thioester and I want to convert it to the acyl chloride by way of Cl minus over the arrow. Well, let's approach this from a mechanistic standpoint. This, the Cl minus will come in and attack the carbonyl, and that will resonate up, because that's what it usually does, right? Negative thing over the arrow attacks the carbonyl, and things pop up. And so we have, this is our intermediate, O minus, Cl, the SCH3, and the methyl that isn't going anywhere. And as usual, that O minus is going to resonate down, and something's going to get kicked out. Now, if we want to get to this product, it would make sense that we kick out the SCH3. But this is a question of, will this reaction work? Will this get us to this final product? And if we think about it, who is the better leaving group here between chlorine and sulfur? Chlorine is. Chlorine minus is much more stable than SCH3 minus. And so, even though it was the chlorine that came in, it's still the better leaving group in this intermediate, so it will just pop right off. And you'll end up going back to what you started with. The final product of this reaction, where you have Cl minus over the arrow, would just be your starting reactant. So your rule of thumb is, looking at that chart, you can't turn any of those things that are less reactive into something that's more reactive unless you turn it into carboxylic acid. That was a rule we gave you for the carboxylic, a carboxylic acid derivatives chapter. Carboxylic acid is an incredible molecule for your synthetic purposes because every single thing that you can make of its derivatives can be made from carboxylic acid, and carboxylic acid can become any of its derivatives. So for example, what if I wanted to turn a thioester into the acyl, hal the acyl chloride? Well, since I can't just use Cl minus over the arrow, my goal should be to turn this into carboxylic acid first, and then turn that carboxylic acid into an acyl chloride. So then that begs the question, how do we turn a thioester into carboxylic acid? Well, if you've seen that chart that is either posted in that carboxylic acid derivative synthesis video I posted, or that chart that your TAs have very kindly written up for you, the, pretty much every single carboxylic acid derivative can be turned into carboxylic acid by way of H3O positive, just some hydronium. And this is the equivalent of writing H plus with H2O as well. So what's going to happen is H2O positive will convert this into the carboxylic acid. And then how do we convert carboxylic acid into an acyl chloride? We use SOCl2. So this is how you would go about the synthesis if your goal is to turn a thioester into an acyl halide. 
Since the nasal halide is more reactive, you can't do it directly. You go through carboxylic acid as an intermediate, and then you turn that into your acyl halide. Okay? Now, for synthetic reason, for, uh, for an additional useful reaction for synthesis, I think it's worth showing how do we turn carboxylic acid into a thioester going forward. So we saw that if we want to turn a thioester into carboxylic acid, all we needed was H3O positive. But what about going in the other direction? What if I wanted to turn carboxylic acid into a thioester? Well, let's pause for a moment. Mo let's pause for a moment and compare a thioester to a regular ester, where we had carbonyl OCH3. What was our reaction that allowed us to convert a carboxylic acid into a regular ester? That was our Fischer esterification reaction that we learned in lecture, which was just H plus, and then whatever OR group we need, so in this case OCH3, and then we just put a hydrogen on that OCH3, so HOCH3. And if I wanted this to be OFO, well then I would use, instead of HOCH3, I would use H O ethyl. And if I want if I wanted this to be instead of O ethyl, if I wanted it to be some crazy nonsense like that, well, same deal. H O and then that crazy nonsense. Doesn't matter. The point is, all you're doing is you're replacing the OH with the OR that's over the arrow. So if that's how we do it for esters, how do you think we're doing it for thioesters? Basically the same way, but instead of oxygen, we're going to use sulfur. So if I want to turn this OH into SCH3, what I'm going to do is H plus over the arrow, and then HSCH3 under it, okay? And if you don't feel comfortable using this, and you prefer using SCH3 minus, well, what you can do is convert that carboxylic acid into the acyl halide using SOCl2, because we know acyl halides can become everything. They just can't be made from anything, because they're so reactive. And then how do we turn an acyl halide into a thioester? Well, we've seen it now three times. We just put that SR group over the arrow, so in this case, SCH3 minus. So here are two ways of turning a carboxylic acid into an intended uh, thioester. And with that, that's my general rules, for react, uh, my general rules about reactivities and um, reactions for thiol.